Well, let me start with a question or two. Um, it appears that this fall that Nicolas Cage is going to be left behind. I don't know if you've all seen the trailer. Uh, there is another edition of Left Behind coming out, or new, new, new movie coming out. Uh, you can catch it on, on, I'm sure, on the internet or Rotten Tomatoes or someplace like that. Um, Fellas, tell me, uh, I think, Dr. Heinsohn, you are familiar with this movie coming out. What do you think? Are, is it, this going to be a help? Is it going to be a hindrance uh, to, the, to the, uh, the discussion about prophecy? Well, it'll certainly, I think, add to the discussion about prophecy. The challenge with uh, movies that have that kind of a theme to it is everybody who doesn't like that view will then feel compelled to say why they don't like the idea of the rapture and say something against it, but uh, uh, that's because of the publicity that it'll receive. Now, just as a quick inside, uh, Tim LaHaye uh, was not involved in the movie directly at all, nor the previous ones that they attempted to do. Uh, he didn't even like the first ones uh, that came out 15 years ago or so, hated him, in fact, uh, has seen this movie and has endorsed it. Uh, he feels like it's fair to his book, fair to what he's trying to say, and the question is, how do you flesh out the story of the rapture uh, if it were actually to occur. Uh, are clothes going to fall off? Are babies going to be left behind or taken? Are planes going to crash? Well, that's all speculation. The Bible doesn't specifically address those issues, but whenever the dead are raised and the living are caught up, we can't assume everybody's just walking, uh, that uh, something's got to happen at some point and sometime. So this is an attempt to deal with that. Uh, and uh, this is a first-rate movie. If you watch the trailer, uh, it'll get your attention. It'll be released on October the 3rd. And uh, I think for the average person, uh, it will speak to them and get their attention. For theologians who have a totally opposite view, it'll frustrate the daylights out of them. All right. Any of you others want to make a mention or comment about that? Are any of you others movie buffs in this way and you just can't hardly wait to see it? I wonder if Nicolas Cage is a believer. Is Nicolas Cage a believer? I don't know. I don't know. Um, that will come out of eventually, I suppose. But I do know that David Jeremiah and I were asked to make uh, comments on the whole idea of the rapture uh, for a video trailer of some sort that can be used with this. I still don't know when and how that's going to be used, but just that inside comment. Uh, it, it gets people thinking about this again. I mean, we just had an airplane disappear uh, somewhere, supposedly in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we have some uh, incredible crises going on around the planet right now, so the timing is really, really good for something like this to get people's attention. Ken, I would say this. Anything that gets people talking about uh, the Bible, uh, about uh, the gospel, mm -hmm. is good. Uh, that part of it's good. Uh, the negative is, of course, uh, if it doesn't represent well the scriptures. I think the other thing we have to say, and I say this to many of my friends who are on the other side who take things like the Left Behind series or used to be the late great planet Earth and uh, go on bombing raids, is remember uh, they are writing novels. Yeah. They're not writing an expositional, exegetical, critical commentary of Matthew or the Thessalonian letters or Revelation. So be fair. Mm -hmm. Recognize what it is. Recognize the genre of the book or the genre of the movie and they're doing just a, a what if suppose it were to happen today what might it be like and that's all they're doing and so don't press them uh, and criticize them for doing something that they weren't trying to do anyway well since we're talking about um entertainment, popular culture. Uh, let's continue that theme just a little bit longer and I've got a sort of a three-part question First part's pretty easy, middle may be a little more difficult, and third part, we'll see who wants to handle it. Uh, last month, Penny and I went to a bluegrass uh, concert, and we enjoy that kind of music, and uh, the band sang a song called The 21st of May, and it was a song uh, lampooning Harold Camping. Uh, and, uh, you know, remember just a couple of years ago, Harold Camping had predicted that the rapture would occur on uh, the 21st of May, and that was, you know, and that was the whole, that was the chorus line, hallelujah, it's the 21st of May, you know, and that, that was, it was, you know, making fun of the idea, uh, 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 and Sam knows what group I'm talking about. Um, so, three points to this, and you can take, you know, 
What do you have to say to those that, of, uh, that are in the pre-trib camp that seem to not be able to resist the temptation to set dates? I mean, there, there have been those who have done this, and, and, and I know, Dr. Heinsen, you mentioned that here this morning. And second, and this may be a little more difficult, there are many pre-trib advocates who may not set dates, but they do find themselves attempting to discern the signs of the times. How does that fit in with the notion of imminency? And in third, how do you respond against the accusation of bad fruit? In other words, that, that, that the doctrine of pre-tribulational rapture uh, are, are, and, this, and the, uh, this idea, this is the sort of thing it produces. It doesn't produce good things. It produces, the, it produces bad things in the, in the body of Christ, so therefore it must not be a good doctrine. Like I said, uh, so let's start with the first part. What do you have to say to those who, who, who seem to be, cannot resist the temptation to set dates? Because you talked about that yep. in your first hour, too. Well, uh, I guess what I would say is I get constant questions about Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, the Feast of Trumpets in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, in 1988, when I was leading a congregation... 88 I, reasons. Uh, 88 reasons why the rapture will happen... Uh, in 1988. There was yeah. a book written. I got a phone call about a week before the uh, holiday celebration from a girl who was all upset because she said the rapture is going to happen in a week and uh, I haven't told my parents about my faith yet and I really am afraid that I'm going to be raptured and they won't know and she was just frantic and I said I've got really bad news for you and she said what? I said the rapture could happen before we're done with this conversation and I said, she said, so it's not going to happen next week? I said, it, I don't know when it's going to happen, and anyone that ever says they do, whether it's Harold Camping or a book that's written, it's absolutely terrible thing to do, because they are saying they know something that Jesus said he did not. Uh, and so date setting is just something that, that I don't understand how anyone thinks it's okay to do, because no man knows the day or the hour of his appearing. And so... I guess we're never going to get away from date setters, but we should we should keep our distance as best we can. So, yeah, you yeah. also you also have uh, date suggesters. <laughs> they won't set a date, but they'll suggest a date. Yeah, uh, it would appear to me that it has to be uh, before such and such a time. Uh, also, just out of interest, Harold Camping was not pre-trip. Harold Camping was an amillennialist. Harold Camping was not predicting the rapture. He was predicting Judgment Day. He was predicting the second go. coming. Uh, so even our millennialists can come up with a date setter uh, along the way. Uh, and there's lots that of answers that now. There's yeah. a lot of yeah. bad fallout from a lot of eschatology. Uh, if I believe that uh, we have to uh, bring in the kingdom in a post-millennial vision, uh, then if you're going to be Duivir de Rochduni or whoever, you're going to try to uh, control the government. You're going to try to change the law. You're going to try to set up a theocracy uh, in order to uh, be fair to your theology. And uh, theocracies haven't worked well in Geneva, London, uh, or in a lot of places uh, historically. Uh, and God didn't call us to set up a theocracy. We get a theocracy when the king comes back. In the meantime, in my opinion, we're citizens of the spiritual kingdom as he rules in our hearts. Uh, but we don't get a literal kingdom on earth till he returns to reign and rule here. I would say it's a terrible irony of history that pre-tribulationism is tagged with setting dates. Pre-tribulationism was the view that avoided setting dates. Date setting is all other tribulation positions because all the others expect the rapture to come after uh, predicted eschatological events which one should be able to see and then be able to predict how far you are then to the coming of the Lord. It was in the um, 1830s when futurism, that's, that's uh, pre-tribulationism is a futurist view that sees the whole tribulation as in the future, comes into uh, historical articulation with a rapture that is imminent and consequently there are no signs by which it can be predicted it could happen any moment so technically a pre-tribulationist cannot be a date setter it just can't but 
when you get into the early 20th century and the, you know, the immigration into Palestine and the establishment of the state of Israel, there were a number of pre-tribulationists that felt, you know, somewhat vindicated by the way history was moving and then began to talk, well, we can't see the signs of the times, but maybe we can see the signs of the signs <laughs> of the times, you know? And then so, so then you have some beginning to move into that. But technically speaking, pre-tribulationism is the view that avoids date setting. All right. Ken, there's an old uh, Bob Newhart show Mm -hmm. where someone comes into him for counseling and uh, he goes through all these uh, this issue that he's struggling with and he's you know he's just lamenting I can't stop doing this 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 and finally Bob Newhart with a very gentle counseling hand said stop it <laughs> just <coughs> stop it yeah and he said yeah, yeah and he said, no no stop it yeah so when it comes to date setting stop it, stop it. Yeah. Don't do it anymore because when you do, you have one inglorious thing in common with all the other date setters for almost 2,000 years. You will be wrong like all of them were wrong. Not a good camp to be in. Yes. And then you cause uh, the baby to get thrown out with the bathwater when you do yeah. that. When we over speculate, uh, and it's pure speculation, not biblically based, and it doesn't happen, then those who reject the view, say, well, there's exhibit A of why I'm not uh, going to hold that view. And the weak of faith get wounded. Yeah. 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 Did you have something I you want to say? I accumulated a list in my study of the 17th and 18th century of about 80 date setters with their dates. Wow. Overwhelmingly, they were historicists, mm -hmm. and they would try to figure out when the 1290 days, which would be 1290 years, began. Mostly, they would date it from Constantine, mm -hmm. and that would put it in somewhere in the, six, the 17th century, actually. And then they started extending it and saying, well, maybe it wasn't Constantine, maybe it was, you know, the, uh, one of these popes that's, when does that 1290 years start counting? So if I hear you correctly, uh, other than saying, stop it, I heard that clearly, it, it, this may be a case of the pot calling the black, and whenever this accusation is made against uh, the pre-trib position. Let me ask you some, some now some uh, uh, it, questions that now relate more to certain scriptures. Was Paul uh, hopeful that Jesus would come back in his day? He believed yes. he could. Yeah. I mean, does it, I mean, I what would Paul, be some of the evidence? I mean, well, I th you, uh, uh, this <coughs> morning, um, uh, Ed cited uh, Titus 2. We are to look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. And uh, I think Paul lived in the light of his imminent return. I think, I did not think, I don't think, I think they're wrong who say Paul was certain that he would come in his lifetime. Some more critical New Testament scholars have argued that. Some even argue that Paul changed his view over time. I think that's a very poor reading of the New Testament. I think Paul believed it could happen in his lifetime, and therefore he lived and he worked and he did what he did in that light. In it, where he'd say, we who are alive and remain. He was hopeful. You would express that. You'd see that as his expression of hope. Yet, yet as a balance to that, he also said, uh, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Uh, and I think as he faces the execution in Rome at the very end, uh, he may have still been hopeful the Lord might come, but I think he's also willing uh, to roll his head around and look back at that guy and say, you can do what you want to, pal, but for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Yeah, uh, the other thing is you have to remember eminency does not mean that there is nothing that can happen before he comes. It has to do with what we know, you know, what's, what's predicted. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Paul in many places uh, expects that Christ could come, uh, you know, we who are alive, who are left. Uh, Philippians 3, uh, Christ is going to come from heaven and change our glorious body, our, our, our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Uh, we shall not all sleep, 1 Corinthians 15. The use of the first uh, uh, person pronoun plural uh, indicates that he saw himself as potentially one of those who are going to be alive at Christ's coming. A as things move on, it becomes... Uh, more apparent to him that he's probably going to die and he indicates in his later letters that you know the time of his departure is coming you know and so but uh, but he doesn't know because 
uh, you know, it has not been revealed exactly when the Lord is coming. One looks and anticipates. There's a probability on the one side, probability on the other, but we have to be ready for whenever he comes. Well, let's follow up now with some of the, some of the various texts that um, people discuss when we're talking about the time of the rapture. And, and, and I re realize this, you know, you all are pre-trib, uh, pre-millennial, pre-millennial, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're monolithic. So tell me, uh, how is your understanding of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24? Do you understand it to be entirely future, entirely past, uh, half and half, or both at the same time? In other words, how do you, how do you approach Matthew chapter 24? Does anybody want to try to try to address that? Well, I'll jump in and then the others can go uh, where they want to go. Uh, first of all, um, this may surprise some people, I don't think the rapture is in Matthew 24. Okay. I don't think it's talking about the rapture. I think it's talking about the second coming. So I'm not a pre-tribulationist who finds the rapture in Matthew 24. Uh, secondly, I think that what Jesus is doing is what is very common with prophecy, and he is talking about a near event that is typical of a final climactic eschatological event. So do I think he has... Both and, the, the absolutely, near and far. So both and, near and far. He has in view the immediate destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 when Titus comes in, and that is a partial fulfillment of the abomination of desolation, which also had been fulfilled with Antiochus Epiphanes when he came in and uh, desecrated uh, the altar in the temple, so, uh, which was predicted by Daniel. So you have a first fulfillment there. You have a second typical fulfillment with the destruction of Jerusalem. But then I think that uh, Matthew 24, 15 matches up with the second Thessalonians 2, uh, where you have the man of sin uh, coming in and uh, setting up a standard and proclaiming himself to be God, which I also think is uh, in harmony with Revelation 13 and the appearance of the first beast, who is, I believe, the Antichrist. So that's how I understand Matthew 24. So it is a both and. It looks to the near destruction of Jerusalem, but it is also looking down the corridors of history to that climactic coming again of Christ and the abomination of desolation being fulfilled in a coming literal future Antichrist. That's how I understand it. Okay. Others want to contribute? Uh, I would agree exactly with what Dr. Aiken said. I would add that uh, almost all um, expositors, uh, interpreters of the Olivet Discourse see a change. There's a structural change in Matthew. It's at Matthew 24:36, uh, where you move from the first part to the second part of the discourse. And there's a difference. There's, a, there's just a difference between the two. The first part moves in a sequence of events. It, it uses the word beginning. It uses the word end. It, uh, it moves from the beginning to the end in a sequence. Uh, the second part, 2436, uh, speaks uh, of a whole. It speaks uh, of the day. It speaks generally. Uh, and it speaks of the coming. Uh, and, and looks at it as, as a whole. And the difficulty in interpreting it is how to relate the two parts. Uh, the difficulty is that some people, if uh, when they look at Matthew 24, 36, of that day or hour no one knows, uh, they think that that's talking about the appearance that occurs at the end of the sequence in the first part. The Son of Man appears in the sky and so on. But um, it doesn't appear that that's the best way to interpret it. There's, there's two contrasting descriptions in Matthew 24, uh, what is it, 32 to 35, where he gives the parable of the budding trees. And the budding trees say, when you see these things occurring, then you know that he is near, right at the door, okay? And then he says, and I tell you, all these things will happen to this generation. Well, that's all these things up to the appearing, which that's the point I think the preterists miss. Uh, all that is going to happen is a pattern on that generation, but uh, whether or not the whole pattern, including the appearing of the Son of Man in the sky, occurs in that generation is... Jesus says, unknown. 
And if it doesn't happen, then it projects. The whole thing projects in the future. The second part of the discourse, I believe, is looking at the whole pattern that the first part described. And in Luke, it's that day. Uh, that day, that whole event sequence, uh, when will that happen? No one knows. Uh, and it could be from some of the parables um, far into the distance because the people, uh, the servants, are, are not mindful that the master could return at any moment. He's delayed <coughs> a long period of time. That's a possibility. So there's a difference in the structure of the discourse. The two parts are important in, in interpretation. Just to throw a wrench here, uh, I, I was actually taught and uh, believed that for many years, although I've read a recent article. Uh, and I think that the, uh, John Hart, a colleague of mine, wrote this. He said that uh, the question, tell us when will these things happen? What is the sign of your coming? and the end of the age, he sees a chiastic structure. Uh, and the chiasm is, uh, what is the sign of your coming? And what is the uh, end of the end of the age? And uh, he says that the, the end of the age then is described in verses 4 through 35, the sign. Uh, and, then, uh, and then it answers, uh, when will these things happen? So in basically verses 4 through 35, you have the signs. And then in verse 36, you have, so it's A, B, B, A. Uh, what is the, when will these things happen, and what is the sign? And so the sign is then answered first. And then verse 36, the question of when is answered. Verse 36, no, now concerning the day of the hour, or the hour, no one knows. And I, I think that that, is a really helpful way when you read the text. It, it's all about the signs up until verse 35, and that if you read the signs, you should be able to identify them. And then in verse 36, uh, he says, but when? No one knows. Does he also apply a chiastic understanding to Mark 13 and Luke 21? No, he, he sees it in Mark, uh, in Matthew alone. But not Luke, Luke and Mark will set uh, forth the Olivet Discourse more in a straightforward uh, I, way? I would have to ask him that okay. because he was writing about Matthew. Okay. And I, but I thought it was a really uh, interesting... And there's an article out? Yeah, uh, uh, two articles. Where, where are they? Uh, some journal. I, I, <laughs> read, <laughs> I, I read them before they were... Somewhere they were, in the world. No, no, they were submitted, <laughs> but he gave them to me before he submitted them. Yeah, so he, I read he them. gave that. that, we'll post it. So okay. folks could he gave that to one it. talk at the pre-trib conference, so that's got to be on the pre-trib yeah. Yeah. whatever it is, website. I think it's the conservative theological journal that he did it in. But uh, uh, his name is John Hart, a uh, really fine New Testament scholar. Well, as I said, uh, I, I did, didn't expect a monolithic answer there because Matthew 24 is a challenge. Dr. Aiken, can I follow up? Um, because I think, I think most, would, most here at, seated up here at the front would agree with you that the rapture is not in Matthew 24, maybe not everyone. But there are those who have understood Matthew 24, 40, Two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch, therefore, you do not know the hour your Lord does come. Um, I think I know what your answer is going to be, uh, but since you don't understand those verses to be re referring to the rapture, how do you understand those verses? Those who are left are actually left to go into the millennial kingdom. In other words, you, do, you, you, you don't want to be one of those taken. No. Yeah. Now, I want to be fair here. Uh, I've got dear friends, for example... Um, uh, Jerry Vines uh, is convinced that the rapture is in Matthew 24, and, and many other good scholars too, and he thinks that that does refer to them being taken away uh, in the rapture. Also, John MacArthur, who is like one of my ultimate heroes, he thinks Matthew 24 for the for almost exclusively is futuristic, completely future, and does not see it really uh, applying in any way to uh, first century fulfillment. At all. Mm -mm. Okay. And and I would, I would go to uh, John Hart's article again, it, the, since this is the section answering the question of when, and he says no one knows, and how, this is how it will be, yeah. and he sees the rapture there, two men. Okay. 
okay. in the field. The, yes. uh, the <coughs> saying there, the two uh, will be in the field, one taken, one left, reappears in Luke 17, and it's the Luke inversion that I think clarifies what it means to be taken. Because they ask him when he says uh, some will be taken, some will be left, they ask where. Not where will they be left, they know where that is. Where will they be taken? And then he gives this uh, parabolic response where the dead bodies are, there the vultures gather, which means they're taken in judgment, they're taken in death. The point is that death falls upon some, you know, and it falls uh, suddenly. Some are taken in it and some are left. And this is what you see in the book of Revelation with the kind of serial judgments that are taking place during that time. Can uh, one thing that you, one group that you referred to in your previous answer, Dr. Blazing, you mentioned preterist. For the sake of, of the audience here, not everyone may know what the, a preterist is or preterist, preterist interpretation. Would you go ahead and explain what a preterist interpretation would be of Matthew 24? Yeah, the preterist view is that what's being described there all took place in the first century. Uh, Jesus is describing uh, the, the destruction of Jerusalem that would take place in 70 AD, uh, and that's all he was describing. But what you have to say, if you take that view, um, then you have to say that the second coming described in Matthew 24 occurred in 70 AD, which they say it did, and we're kind of surprised. <laughs> but they say, nevertheless, uh, it you know must have happened then. The problem with the preterist view is that leaves you no know, second coming. And, uh, unless, unless you're R.C. Sproul and then he yeah. punts and says preterism. it's a partial preterism. Yeah. That, uh, the majority of the predictions were fulfilled in AD 70, but being a Presbyterian who has to acknowledge the Westminster Confession of Faith, which affirms the second coming, uh, you can't deny that there will ever be a second coming, although full preterists do. So then he opts for what he calls a partial preterist view. Uh, that most of it was fulfilled in 70 AD, and in the very end of time, Christ will finally come, and you'll have a general judgment, and then eternity. No kingdom on earth ever. Okay. Well, um, another passage of Scripture that critics of the pre-trib position uh, that they will appeal to, of course, is Second Thessalonians. Uh, in which the church at Thessalonica, uh, whenever Paul writes to them the second letter, uh, they are concerned that they are they are experiencing judge and, and Dr. Blazy, I may be walking on some of the things you're going to you're, you're going to discuss tonight. And if I am, say so. Um, but um, you are okay. <laughs> no, it's it's okay. Go yeah, l l let me. Th the one question that comes up is is that Paul then says to them in chapter two. Don't, don't you remember that I said the man of sin must, you know, would be revealed at this time, and he's not being revealed. You know, we're not in the day of the Lord because the man of sin is not here. Critics of the pre-trib position would say, why didn't he just say, look, you weren't raptured? In other words, if we held to a, you know, if Paul was holding to a pre-trib rapture, uh, you know, one way to tell, to, to point out to them very quickly that you're not in the tribulation is that, look, you, you know, if you're still here. Uh, you know, he, in other words, he doesn't. At, this would have been an opportune time to have uh, presented a pre-tribulational rapture interpretation, but Paul doesn't. And I know that, that you men, this is not the first time you've heard that that that, that criticism. How do you respond? Uh, how would you respond to to those who make that kind of claim? And you know, I'm thinking of a number that do. Anyone want to jump in on that? Give, give, give them a, just a little enough to make, it, make them curious. Yeah, <laughs> make them want to come back tonight. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there's questions. Why didn't he answer it, you know, in, in one way? I think actually he does come around to the rapture at the end of the chapter because after going through the, the tribulation scenario, then he comes back around to say, look, don't be misled by a reported letter hold to the letter you actually have from us. And he refers them back to the first letter and uh, holding on to the hope that was mentioned in the first letter. And that's where I think okay. you do have the uh, rapture very clear. Um, the problem in, in 2 Thessalonians 2 has to do with the ellipsis, at least 
a good part of the problem at the beginning. When Paul says, uh, you know, I don't want you to be disturbed by a reported letter seemingly from us uh, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come because, and then we have this omission. He says, because unless the apostasy first and then the man is lawlessness, don't you remember about him? And he goes off talking about him and doesn't finish the sentence. This is typical of Paul. It happens elsewhere in his letters. So then the translators have to try to complete the sentence. And so they put in this phrase. You'll see it in the New American Standard Bible, for example, in italics. For that day will not come. Okay? But that day will not come is not actually there in the text. It's a translator insertion. It could very well, you could very well insert a phrase, for that day has not come unless, which is to say, the point is, what's the point of the sequence he's giving? Is he giving a sequence of events that have to occur before the day comes, or is he giving the sequence of events that belong to the day? Yeah. And I, ref I, I believe the latter. But uh, we'll give a little more reason for that this evening. Ken, let me say yes. this, and, and uh, Ed alluded to it but didn't explicate it. I think one of the strongest arguments for the pre-trib rapture, building on what Craig just said of go back to the first letter, is the fact, remove chapter and verse uh, distinctions for just a moment because they, weren't not, they were not there in the original. They come along later, and thank God they did. Why does he discuss the rapture before the day of the Lord? Yeah. If the rapture were after the eschatological day of wrath, it makes sense that that would have been in chapter 4, and then the rapture discussion would have been in chapter 5. In other words, the chronology of Revelation, I mean, of, of 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, most naturally reads pre-tribulational. Rapture takes place, then comes the eschatological day of the Lord, for which, as he says, you are not destined to, for wrath, in the context, is the wrath of the day of the Lord. And so I think what Craig says is exactly correct. He's reminding him, go back to the first letter, where I laid this out for you with great clarity. Now, in light of this false letter you've received, let me take you through again the sequence of events. And, of course, then you even get down to the restrainer being taken out. Now, that's, of course, that's multifaceted. It yeah. is? Yeah, okay, well, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Uh, let me say, first of all, I don't believe that the omnipresent Holy Spirit is taken out. And sometimes we who uh, take this in a certain way get that criticism. That's not valid. I don't think that the Holy Spirit is taken out. That does not negate that his restraining influence cannot be removed and cannot be removed through the body of Christ or through the church, which is what I think is the easiest understanding of that text. It doesn't make sense to this government. Does it? There are a number of things that are thrown out there. And again, I try to be fair. I, I, I'm not saying that for certain because he doesn't say for certain it is the church. He doesn't say that. But he does say the restrainer is removed and then all hell breaks loose on the earth. Well, it would make sense in light of 1 Thessalonians that that restraining influence is the presence of believers, the church, Spirit stays because people can't be converted apart from the Holy Spirit, and there will be lots of people converted, especially Jewish persons, I believe, during the, the day of the Lord, during the tribulation periods. So I think you throw that in as well, and it, it fits very well. It's not really a problem uh, for the pre-tribulational view. And during the day of the Lord, of course, the... Uh it says, I'll pour out my spirit on all my kind. Yeah, so. You've got people coming from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Who are these? These are they. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Where did they come from? They came out of the great tribulation. Yeah, so people will come to the Lord. I, let me, I, I think on Second Thessalonians 2, uh, I think what, we are, we're, what we're dealing with, what Paul was dealing with, was sort of an incipient post-tribulationalism. <laughs> That's what he, people, and, and if he had said, well, the rapture hasn't happened first, I, these are not people that were going to say, well, so I think their answer was say, would have been, oh, yeah, you say. Uh, they already were, were inclined through this false letter to believe that the rapture would be at the end of the day of the Lord and that they were in the tribulation. And so Paul, rather than just getting into a he, shed, he said, she said, kind of you say, I say argument, he says, okay, you think you're in the day of the Lord? 
the man of lawlessness has not been revealed yet. Uh, now what? And so in a sense, his, his argument isn't about when will the rapture take place. His argument is, are you in the day of the Lord? And it's obvious that you're not. So that's, the, that's what I think he's the doing. The problem there. for the post-tribulational view is the shock of the Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they were expecting the rapture to happen at the end of a sequence of tribulational events, and that's what he had taught them in the first letter, then if a report goes out that the day of the Lord has actually begun, they shouldn't be shocked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should be excited. This is what we expect, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and we're even closer now, you know, than, than we were before. But instead, they're absolutely shocked. Yeah. And so that's what it, why he has to write them. And it's also, I think, a good reminder to us that when crisis events occur in the world, there, people always get their antenna up and say, oh, prophecy is being fulfilled, and this is this, and that is that, and we're at the end, etc. And then eventually the crisis passes. Uh, remember Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. Uh, there are other indicators of the end. Uh, and we have to be very cautious there if we love the prophetic message not to run ahead of God and try to make everything a prophetic fulfillment. The Y2K, uh, the destruction of 9-11 of and all of those kinds of things, etc. Uh, it, it's very, very important to realize uh, that we have a great commission to fulfill uh, of preaching the gospel to the world uh, and that that needs to be our focus, but it also should be our focus in light of the fact that the Lord could come at any time. You know, right at the beginning you had this question where you t started with date setting, but what do you do about seeking the signs? I, I think that's really important sort of in, in answer to that question is that sometimes we say, oh look, uh, there's a rising tide of anti-Semitism. Oh, look, Israel is in the land. But even then, with all those things, we need to be very careful to say, right now, this looks like what this is pointing to, but we're still not going to say that this is that. Or, you know, I, I think there's very limited things. I, I happen to believe that the regathering of the Jewish people to the land of Israel is a preparation for the fulfillment of prophecy, but nevertheless, I want to be very careful about uh, speculation about things. And every now and then you can, you can say, well, this might be, and, and I do see the rising anti-Israel attitude in the United Nations and around the world as something that seems to be uh, preparing the way for the end. But you know what? Anti-Semitism could go away and then come back. Yeah, you know, I, think, I, I, think, I, I want to be really careful. Yeah, the danger, I think, is always trying to view the future through the eyes of the present. Exactly. So yeah. right now, it looks like it might be this way, but 50 years from now, it may not. Did, you know the, the famous story where Elisha uh, tells the, the man, uh, the king's servant, uh, that the, the, the uh, famine's going to break. I think it's the first king's, second king's seven or eight. Uh, the famine's going to break, and, uh, and he's oh, yeah, even if the windows of heaven opened... How could that happen? And uh, that the 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 food won't be will go up, go down in price dramatically. And of course, what happens? They the lepers find uh, the military encampment that has been abandoned. They get all the food. All of a sudden, there's a mad rush, and uh, the the king's servant is sees that the price of food has dropped, but he also gets trampled under, just as Elisha said. The point that I bring that up is the prophecy was fulfilled literally, but no one could have anticipated how it would be fulfilled. And that's what I think we have to be cautious about. I think Bible prophecy will be fulfilled literally, mm -hmm. but we would never anticipate how it's going to happen. So that, that's a great caution for us not to be overly speculative. I would like to refer also all, all over to Isaac Hughes' essay on the interpretation of biblical prophecy. I don't know if anyone's read it, but... Um, he was quite a... I, I didn't know that he wrote things. Yeah. I thought he was mostly having no, no, apples no. fall on his he head. No, no, he spent more time <laughs> writing prophecy yes. about privacy than he did about science. On my shelf, I have his yeah. interpretation of Daniel and the Revelation, and uh. I really recommend it. You actually can get it on Amazon. Um, but anyway, um, what he said was Christ w w spoke very hard <laughs> because they were unable to interpret the signs of the Messiah's first coming. Mm -hmm. And he said, we as Christians can fall under that same condemnation if we are not able to interpret the signs of his second coming. So he firmly believed, and I firmly believe, that there must be signs of his second coming that we must be alerted to. Hmm. 
Like Jill in uh, Narnia, who for kept forgetting the signs. Yeah. Not supposed to. Uh -huh. so. let's, uh, let's open the uh, questions now to the floor. If you've got some questions, would you please stand? And Carol's got a microphone. Say your, your name, please, and then ask your question and hand the mic back to Carol. And we certainly would l uh, love to hear your question now at this time. I've got several more, but I wanted to be sure and give you all the opportunity to ask questions at this time. What, who would be the first? Yes, right here. Go ahead. Charles Swanson. This is for uh, Dr. Rydelnik. Uh, your Jewish colleague, um, Marvin Rosenthal's book, uh, Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church, I found it to be very interesting. If it occurred like two-thirds through the tribulation, you know, when the day of the Lord begins, when, whenever that is, that also would, there would be imminence about that. So um, what's your... How would I answer the pre-Wrath Rapture? think that there's a chronology in the book of Revelation that that the that it is it is chronological I think that the seal judgments uh, are part of the first part of the tribulation period and the seal judgments are called the wrath of the lamb uh, remember they say let the rocks fall on us because why because we're experiencing the wrath of the lamb uh, therefore there's the wrath of the lamb in the first part of the tribulation and so I think that the, the rapture is pre-wrath, but I think the wrath happens right from the outset. And uh, that's a simple answer of what I would give, that the rapture takes place before the wrath of God falls, but the entire tribulation is the wrath of God on earth, and so we are delivered from the wrath to come. That's a simple answer. Uh, and uh, uh, what, what, I <laughs> what I would also say about this, and I, I, I am a really committed pre-tribulational rapture person, as I restud I, I studied it before, just preparing. I did a lot of study. I read a bunch of books in preparation for coming to this conference. And I'm even more committed and convinced of it than I was before, and I was a lot before. That being said, I don't think we should uh, divide, obviously. Uh, there's room for a lot of opinions, and uh, it's not one of the core issues of the faith. And so uh, I think th that the danger would be if we we're going to make pre-wrath or pre-trib or mid-trib, post-trib or whatever, pan-trib, whatever it is, an essential, it's not. And we can uh, love each other in the faith uh, in the Lord regardless. Anybody else? I would just add, basically, I think what Rosenthal and Van Campen tried to do is say, well, the word wrath doesn't appear till the sixth seal. Therefore, it didn't begin till then. But if you read the chapter... Christ the Lamb is opening all the seals, and the accumulation of this judgment is building and building and building, and what you have then is a summary statement at the end of the chapter where they're saying, enough, enough, let the rocks and the mountains fall on us, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, which uh, we would agree with him, the church is not the object of wrath, therefore she's not the one crying out here. And the sad thing in Revelation is, that while there are a host of people who believe in the seventh chapter, later on in Revelation, it, it continually says, and they did not repent, and they did not repent. And there will be a vast host of people who, in spite of those judgments, will not believe. Come tonight at 7 o'clock. <laughs> there you go. Uh, there you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll deal with the issue of the day of the Lord. That's the issue. The issue is, what is it? And what is it in relationship to the term we use, the tribulation? Uh, the latter, the day of the Lord, is actually, in biblical theology, is a biblical theological theme. The tribulation is not the theme in Scripture the same way. It's a term that we use theologically to refer to Daniel's time of the end what Daniel calls the time of wrath or the time of the end. But the question is, what is the day of the Lord, and how does it relate to that? Okay, and that's, we're going to try to talk about it tonight. Next question. Over here. Say your name and your question. My name is Nathan, <clears throat> and my question is, essentially, how would you respond to some commentators that interpret the rapture as all the believers coming to greet Jesus, King Jesus and coming back to earth as the second coming. I've heard that as a... The entourage a interpretation where you, they meet him outside the city and then they come back in with him. I'm sure you'll, you may need to spell yeah. that out so people understand that. Or maybe yeah, the point is, and this is uh, often made by 
post-tribulationists that the rapture, because of the use of a verb there in 1 Thessalonians 4, the verb is used in context where the ancient custom of a, uh, of, let's say, a king coming to a city, that there is then a delegation of the city that goes out to meet him and accompanies him on in. And so they interpret the rapture then as going up to meet Jesus and then accompanying him down. And I would say that that, that is part of the image, but it doesn't exhaust what Paul's talking about because, first of all, it's not a delegation. It's the whole of believers. The dead are raised. Uh, the living are caught up. Plus, they are caught up to be with the Lord. Okay, There is also a theme of deliverance. And this is coming out of 1 Thess 1.10, which we'll see tonight. 1 Thessalonians 4, the rapture, is explicating what Paul says in chapter 1, verse 10. We are waiting for his Son to come from heaven who delivers us from the wrath to come. There's a deliverance. That's repeated in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. We're not destined for wrath, but for salvation. There's a deliverance. The delegation idea doesn't have deliverance in it, but 1 Thessalonians 4 has a deliverance of the whole company from a coming wrath. So it's not so much that, uh, that this is not somewhere in the imagery, but it certainly doesn't exhaust the imagery. It's not even the predominant imagery, which I would say is one of a deliverance. Can I jump on that just for a second? Uh, the, the, the word that's uh, used is to meet the Lord. That's the one that they say that means a delegation that meets him. Uh, in the new Moody Bible Commentary, which I had a chance to participate in, uh, Kevin Zuber has done the commentaries on First and Second Thessalonians, an outstanding theology prophet, Moody, and uh, he does an extended, if you get that commentary, which I hope every one of you will, <laughs> uh, uh, he did an outstanding job and shows that the word does not have that implicit in every usage. Uh, that it does not require a delegation. And he does a great job, shows all the places in Scripture where it's used, and it doesn't imply a delegation. So uh, frequently the argument is made is the word demands a delegation, and it does not. So. And furthermore, it could have easily said, and they returned with him. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that right there kills that. It, it also doesn't give you a time indication. I mean, in a sense, you could argue, I suppose, yeah. that the rapture takes you out to meet the king, and, then seven and eventually you you'll back. return. The right. question is when. Uh, so you could still have a separation of time for the judgment seat of Christ and for the marriage in heaven. I would go even further, and that is because First Thessalonians... You, you always do. Uh, First <laughs> Thessalonians 5, uh, in talking about the day of the Lord now talks about something that's an extended event. So the deliverance, which 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10 identify uh, as the rapture, uh, taking place at the beginning of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord now is an extended event. Is, is there's not a return immediately uh, in that sequence, but we'll try to talk about that a little bit more tonight. Very good questions, very good questions. Next question that you would have uh, for this uh, august and esteemed panel. Over here. Say your first name and give us your question. Uh, my name is Chip Jackson. I have a two-part question dealing with the practical implications. Uh, part one is, considering theological triage, if eschatology is a third-tier issue, then what are the practical implications of working together and uh, in what kind of situations might that cause tension uh, when people work together in ministry if they have differing eschatological views related to the millennium and the tribulation? And the second part is, uh, do you anticipate having any concerns of the global mission strategies of the IMB considering that the new president is an amillennialist? Let uh, me jump in there. I was about to say, would you go ahead and define... <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Would you go ahead and define, he used some very good, uh, uh, some very important expressions. He said theological triage. Would you go ahead and explain what, you, what he meant sure. when he said that? If you look at uh, Theology for the Church, the uh, concluding chapter is written by Al Mohler on theological triage, talking about first-tier issues, second-tier issues, third-tier issues. First-tier issues are what makes one a Christian. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone, and so on. Second-tier issues are the kind of issues that are necessary for us to do church together. Uh, I love my Presbyterian brothers like all of these guys do. We can't do church planning together because I'm not going to baptize babies, and so that's not going to work. Third-tier issues are where we disagree, but we can work together in the same community of faith uh, because of our common convictions in, in tiers two and one. I would challenge part of your first question in that I don't think eschatology is a third tier issue. Uh, in fact, I would argue that a portion of it is tier one. If you deny the historical, bodily, visible return of Christ, then you're a heretic. Right. That's a tier one issue, okay? Heaven and hell, tier one issues, all right? I do put the t truth of the rapture, tier one. Timing of the rapture, tier three. So. I had the joy of working with Al Moeller for eight years at Southern Seminary, one of my closest friends. My closest friend in all the world is James Merritt, who pastors in Atlanta. Both of them are post-tribulational, premillennial. Uh, it never was a problem. We talked about the issue. We would challenge each other. We would ask questions of each other to sharpen one another. But that was a third-tier issue as to the, the timing of the rapture. So for me, that works well. That's why here... We don't have a confession of faith that requires premillennial, pre-tribulationalism. So we have on this faculty, uh, I don't know how many, I, I've never taken roll call, but we have some brothers that are all millennial, uh, but they believe in a literal, visible, bodily return. They actually believe in imminency, and, uh, which is usually common with most amillennialists, interestingly. And, of course, they believe in the reality of a, of, a, of a hell and a heaven where there's conscious, eternal judgment, our conscious eternal blessing. So that's what I would say there. As far as the uh, IMB issue is concerned, I keep praying for David, one of my closest friends in all the world, that he will see the light and move back to premillennialism. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, in terms of uh, how that will impact the IMB, uh, I'm not concerned a bit. Uh, he absolutely believes all the things I believe that are the cardinal, essential, non-negotiable doctrines of the faith, including those issues related to eschatology. Uh, I would come back also, we never addressed that question that you asked at the very beginning about what about the pre-meal, pre-trib that uh, bears bad fruit. All eschatological systems have those who bear bad fruit. Uh, I think that if one has a healthy, biblically balanced uh, eschatology, regardless of which category you fall in, then you're going to bear good fruit. And uh, of course, I would argue that uh, David Platt uh, has borne wonderful fruit, especially in terms of his passion and vision for missions. And uh, his eschatology may or may not have impacted that, but it certainly hasn't impacted it negatively. I would argue that my own eschatology actually, for me, has been fruitful because it adds, uh, but again, David holds to imminency, so I need to be fair there. It adds a sense of urgency. He could come any day at any time, and therefore I need to be busy about the work of the Lord because there are people out there that I want to hear the gospel, that need to hear the gospel, and I don't know how much time they have left. I don't know. And therefore, there is a sense of urgency that my eschatology actually drives. And, and so that's how I would respond both to David and then also to the issue of uh, uh, triage. Let me go ahead and since, since um, missions and eschatology have been tied together, what, uh, what is, this, uh, how do you all interpret the passage, you know, for the gospel must be first preached among all the nations, then comes the end, before the end. How do you, how do you, in other words, there has, there have been those who have tried to argue that, that there's a certain missiological component to eschatology, and it has impacted our eschato our, our miss missiology at times. So, so, um, anybody want to touch that third iron, or that third rail, or you want to leave it alone? Well, I'll just say this, it's not a problem for the pre-tribulational view. That's uh, what it is a problem for is the post-tribulational view. Yeah. George Eldon Ladd uh, went to great lengths to try to point out, well, 
We just don't know exactly how God may use the phrase every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. I mean, who are we to say that in the way God uh, intended for us to understand that it has not already happened? Well, I'm not going to say that he's wrong, but I think that he is. He's just wrong. Yeah. Well, I don't I think it. it's the most <laughs> natural reading of the text, and that's yeah. what I'm after. Is that the most natural way of understanding that phrase? And I think the answer is no. Uh, what I believe is because of a imminent uh, rapture and the fact that there will be time after that, I think approximately seven years, give or take, given some other details, I look for, and come back to what Ed said earlier, I look for the perhaps greatest ingathering of souls in the history of the world per Revelation 7, both Jew and Gentile. I also think it will be the most horrific time of judgment, and there will be no uh, wafflers in that day. It will be, as Don Carson says, you'll either bear the mark of the Lamb or you'll bear the mark of the beast, mm. but you'll be marked, you'll be identified, and uh, you'll have to declare clearly uh, where your allegiance is. And so I think that it's not a difficulty at all for our view, and it's more of a difficult difficulty for the other views. Okay, very good. We have time for one more question. One more question? Yes, Sam. Yeah. Um, how do you... When speaking about the tribulation uh, itself, the seven years, how do you or do you differentiate between Israel proper and the Jewish diaspora, um, that sort of thing? Uh, why does everyone look at me? Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have the answer. It, it just seems to me that Israel is used two different ways. There's, uh, or multiple ways. Uh, Israel is used of all the Jewish people. Uh, Israel is also used of the political entity in the Middle East, the land of Israel, uh, where the state of Israel exists. And also Israel is used of the true believers among the Jewish people, the true Israel. So it's used in a variety of ways. Uh, I think what it's talking about when it talks about Israel, this is something that most people aren't aware of, uh, that the state of Israel considers every Jewish person to be a citizen. So, for example, when uh, my son moved to Israel, his citizenship was conferred upon him immediately. immediately. No, no five years, because it is, Israel sees themselves as the state for all the Jewish people. So that's, and it's because they understand that Israel is not limited to the state, it encompasses all Jewish people. And I think that's how it's used in uh, end times events when it talks about Israel. 144,000 are not necessarily 144,000 living in the modern state of Israel. There are 144,000 Jews, perhaps from around the world. Sam, I would say this, and I have been uh, very, very uh, pro-Israel uh, since I got right with the Lord when I was 20, went to Crystal College and immediately began to be influenced by W.A. Crystal. Uh, Paige Patterson, Dallas Theological Seminary, and then I immediately began to listen to people like Ed mentioned today, John MacArthur, Chuck Swindoll, and, and I can keep going. So I am extremely, uh, uh, I think, loving and sympathetic. Uh, that quick story, I'm, in, I'm in, in UTA working my PhD in the, ca in the library one day. A lady comes over to me and says, uh, you're an unusual Christian. And I said, well, I, that could mean a lot of things. What do you mean by that? She said, well... It's very clear that you love the Jewish people from just conversations she had been eavesdropping on. She was Jewish, by the way, her, her, her husband, very successful, wealthy doctor in the Dallas area. And she said, and I find that unusual because Christians are responsible for the Holocaust. And so I, you know, took, a, took my breath and then I said, well, you know, actually, I don't think just because one claims to be a Christian doesn't mean they are a Christian. And I said, Germany at that particular time was anything but a Christian nation. And so we began to talk about, I said, well, of course I love the Jewish people. I said, my, my Lord is a Jew. Uh, those who wrote my book are, are, that I love are all Jewish, with few exceptions, if any. And uh, I, I said, I believe there is a, a wonderful day coming when all Israel will be saved and there will be a marvelous ingathering of Jewish persons into, into the kingdom. And she said, uh, you sound like Paul. And I said, Paul who? 
And she said, Paul the Apostle. And I'm like, well, I'm an idiot. But um, <laughs> she said, I said, so you've read the New Testament? She said, oh, many times. And, and I, I'm fascinated by it. So having said that, that does not mean I believe Israel's government is right all the time. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they need to be criticized. And so I can be very supportive of the Jewish people and their right to exist as a nation without being a Zionist. And so I make a, I make a distinction and, uh, because I do think sometimes uh, all, go all governments are fallen and flawed. And therefore, when they do dumb things, they should be criticized. But at the same time, I too am extremely concerned about what appears to me to be a growing anti-Semitic sentiment that is spreading across Europe. And I fear it even has seeds here in uh, North America, certainly among the more mainline, uh, because they don't have a theological conviction and commitment like we do, and therefore they uh, though we'd accuse us of being more politically swayed, and that, that's the, the, the kettle calling the pot black. We're all susceptible to that, and I think in some cases they are susceptible and they are being seduced. If I can just jump in, uh, just I have to do this. Sorry. <laughs> the, the thing about Z Zionist, Zionism just means that there should be a Jewish state in the land of Israel. It doesn't mean anything other than that. And so even though... But some would use it well, well, more. Well, what I'm saying is that technically what you're saying is you affirmed Zionism. And what I think you're saying, yeah, uh, what you are And I think that that's okay. To be, that's all Zionism means. Uh, some people say that uh, being a Zionist means adopting the most uh, expansionist, right-wing, small percentage of Israel, uh, which is only a very small part of Israelis. Uh, so, uh, I just, uh, one of my pet peeves is the abuse of the word Zionism as if it's a dirty word or a racist word. It's not. It just means the idea that there should be a Jewish state uh, in Israel. And uh, I have a new t-shirt that is going to be delivered soon, which says, Unrepentant Zionist. Because <laughs> I do believe that there should be a Jewish state in the land of Israel. My Steve, allegiance to America yeah. is conditional. If America is no longer free, I will withdraw my allegiance to it. My allegiance to Israel is unconditional because God says those who bless the Jews will be blessed, those who curse the Jews will be cursed. And you could even criticize Israel. Oh, yeah, I can criticize, yeah. but yeah. I will yeah. still maintain, I will not yeah. curse Israel. Yes. Yeah, I think, yeah, as long as the, 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 the term unconditional is defined. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been fun this afternoon. And this is, uh, I, I have enjoyed uh, listening to uh, the speakers. The panel discussion has been so informative. Uh, you all have been a great audience. Uh, let's give, uh, show these men our appreciation. I look forward to seeing all of you again at 7 p.m. Uh, and, and I have enjoyed every session from chapel all the way through this afternoon. I'm especially looking forward to hearing Dr. Blazing as he discusses the Day of the Lord. So we'll look forward to that tonight at 7 p.m. God bless you all. Dismissed. <laughs>